Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll introduce who we have up here with us, and each will make some remarks. And then after that, we'll take questions from the media. So from left to right, we have Memphis Associate Athletic Director for Development and the Baseball Sport Administrator, Blair DeBoard. In the center, head baseball coach, Carrick Jackson. And on the right, uh, Vice President and Director of Intercollegiate Athletics, Laird Veach. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Laird to get us started. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for uh, taking the time to, to be here. I do want to start with some, uh, some thank yous. Uh, first of all, to Coach Rock. Uh, I don't know if uh, Coach Rock is here in the room, but um, wherever he is, I want him to know how much we appreciate him. Um, he has been truly a rock for this program, and we are very, very grateful for his years of service. I also want to thank uh, everyone who truly cares about Memphis baseball. So uh, current players, former players, family members, um, donors, staff, et cetera. And uh, speaking of staff, I also want to thank Blair DeBoard. So for those of you that uh, don't know Blair, as, uh, as Michael mentioned, he will be speaking here to you shortly. Uh, but Blair is our Associate Athletic Director for Development. And as a former collegiate baseball player himself, he has oversight over our baseball program. And um, as with our, our women's basketball search, when we hired Katrina Merriweather, you know, Lauren Ashman played a really important role in that search process. And uh, part of that was having someone that really is knowledgeable and networked in that space. And uh, Blair played a very important role. Uh, I, re I relied on him a great deal throughout this search and uh, really appreciate his leadership. So with that, I will let Blair talk more specifically about what we were looking for in this, uh, this specific hire with the baseball coach at Memphis. But, you know, if you kind of just stepped back and made the obvious checklist, you would uh, include things like head coach experience, somebody that knows how to turn a program around, someone that's been at multiple levels, uh, particularly the highest level, like uh, an assistant in the SEC, someone that is uh, very well networked, has a great recruiting uh, ability and network, and there's no question that uh, Carrick Jackson checks all those boxes. We, we truly could not have found someone that is, that is more qualified than, than Carrick. Uh, more importantly, he has an incredible reputation as a great person of high character. I, I can't tell you how many people we spoke to uh, throughout the process, but everyone we spoke to raved about him beyond his coaching experience and the type of person he is and, and, and leader and man that he is. As you'll see, he has a great presence. And uh, people ask me all the time, you know, particularly when we're in a search process, what are you looking for in a head coach, right? What is the X factor? Everybody wants to call it the X factor. Uh, you know, to me, it's someone when I sit down with them, I, I always ask myself the question, would I want to play for him or her, right? And uh, there's no question walking away from that first uh, interaction, he's somebody I'd want to play for. Uh, another way I put it, which I've said many times, it's it's the our, our staff is probably tired of me saying it, but it's that coach that can balance the challenge uh, between providing the love and discipline that young people need these days um, in, in collegiate athletics and our, for our student athletes. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you, as you'll see, and when you meet him, uh, Carrick has absolutely that capacity and ability. I'm also excited that he will not only be a great uh, leader for our young men, but also a great leader for our community. It's not lost on us that outside of HB, uh, the HBCUs, uh, he will be one of three black head coaches in Division I baseball. And how impactful that is, especially here at the University of Memphis and in this city. So we are proud to help bring yet another great leader to, uh, to our community. And I'm also excited because we believe this program has significant upside potential. Uh, particularly consider the timing of our planned renovations with the FedEx Park and Avron Fogelman Field. Um, it's very similar in many respects, again, to when uh, we hired Coach Merriweather and the investments we were making in Elmer Field Fieldhouse. The timing could truly not be better, and we found the right person at the right time. The right person to help us uh, elevate yet to another level and another program. So with that, I will turn it over to Blair for the official duties and honors, but I personally want to thank and, and welcome Coach Jackson and his entire family to, to the Memphis family. Take care. Go Tigers. So when, uh, when Coach Rock informed us of his decision to step down as head coach of the Memphis baseball program, Larry and I got together uh, to outline what characteristics we felt like we needed in the next leader of our program. 
We needed first a leader of young men. We needed someone who has earned respect of their peers, someone who knew what we needed to build a consistent winner here. We needed someone that could, with the ability to identify and recruit talent, specifically some undervalued talent. And then finally, we needed somebody that knew and understood what excellence looks like for a baseball pro program across many levels. As we started to compile and reach out to our um, baseball industry contacts, one name continued to surface as someone we should kick the tires on, and that name was Carrick Jackson. As we started to dig deeper into his career, a couple things stood out to us. His experience was very unique and it was vast. Currently, at that time, he was the president of the MLB Draft League, a league that uh, was specifically created for players, college baseball players, um, with undervalued talent. He was the head coach at Southern University, where he engineered the largest turnaround from one year to the next in college baseball during that time. In year one, they were nine and 33. In year two, they were 34 and 24 with a conference championship, a regional bid, and that was for the first time in 10 years of that program. He had been an agent for the Boris Corporation, one of the premier, if not the premier, baseball player agencies in that industry. He was an assistant coach at the Power Five when Missouri was in the Big 12 and when Missouri was in the SEC. And during that time while he was there, they won the Big 12 championship and also played in the regional. He had been a, re a regional scouting supervisor for the Washington Nationals of Major League Baseball. And he had multiple assistant stints at Division I, Division II, and the junior college levels. It was very unique for our candidate pool. Um, and his career was full of high level successes. It shows that he has a track record of identifying and recruiting talent and, um, and, and success at, at different levels. Another thing that stood out, every baseball person we spoke with, regardless of their circle or their coaching tree, knew of Carrick and would normally respond with something like this. Oh yeah, Carrick Jackson, man, that'd be a great fit for you guys. It was clear that he was respected by his peers, but that was only highlighted by his board of directors seat for the American Baseball Coaches Association and his status as chairman of that same group's diversity and baseball committee. Finally, when we got to the point where we had kind of zeroed in on Carrick and we started really confiding in people and asking them specifically about him, they started any comments by first committing his character and leadership traits. And then they followed with any baseball related items. All of that research though paled in, com in comparison to the impact Carrick had on us when we started talking to him personally about our position. He is passionate about teaching young men and developing future leaders. He is passionate about building a baseball program into a consistent regional participant and acutely aware of the challenges, the challenges that are associated with that. He is passionate about doing it the right way, and he is passionate about the game of baseball in a community like Memphis. Because of those things, Carrick went from being a candidate to the candidate fairly quickly. And when we invited him to meet with a larger group of our staff, their feedback was clear. Carrick was our guy. We are so fortunate to have found a candidate like Carrick to lead our program, and I can't wait for he and his wife, Talia and Laz and Zion, to join this community. Carrick is the perfect fit at the perfect time. He's going to build a winner here, and people in college baseball will take notice. So uh, with that, please join me with a round of applause and in introducing the new leader of the new era of Memphis baseball, Carrick Jackson. Appreciate that. Um, both uh, 
Laird and Blair. Um, great things that you all said. Uh, let's me know my checks cleared. <laughs> so, uh, and to, to all those other people that had great things to say. Um, start off by saying God is great um, and, and he does not make mistakes. Uh, I, I am definitely here in this position uh, because I'm supposed to be here in this position. Um, this program, this community, um, everything that you all are about uh, is something that I'm also about uh, and which makes this for me a very unique opportunity different than any other I believe in the country with the things that I stand for, with the things that I want to get accomplished, with the time that I've been able to spend here in Memphis um, through recruiting, uh, as well as when I was a pro scout, I would come here and I had pro coverage and I covered, covered the Memphis Redbirds, used to come to tournaments here uh, as a recruiter. And then everybody comes to Memphis just to hang out. Um, and so what you learn about this city is it is a very passionate place and what belongs to Memphis, they support it and they embrace it. Um, and so the idea and the opportunity to come here and be able to build something that I think can be on a national level, there wasn't a better place or a better fit to be able to come and get those goals accomplished. And then spending the time that I was able to spend with both Blair and Laird gave me even more um, feeling about this being the right place. Because for me, it's not about the job that I'm doing, it's about the people that I'm working with and being able to connect with them on a level and understanding what they're about and what their passion and what their vision is, not only for the athletic department, but then reading different things about what the passion and the vision is for the University of Memphis itself. I read a quote um, when we um, didn't get into that first round with the Big 12, there was a quote that said, Memphis is one of the top 12 schools in the country at graduating African-American students. That's a big deal in this city and, and, and with what it is that, that the, the university is about. So it was those types of things that attracted me uh, to the position. Oddly enough, um, we came and played here in 2019. Uh, and when we came in 2019, I told my wife, I said, man, that's a job that I believe has a chance to be a powerhouse. Um, and I told other people pr pr prior to uh, coming here that I thought this was a place that had a chance to be a powerhouse and we're coming here with the intention of making this place a powerhouse i plan on us being one of the top 50 programs in the country year in and year out and i think we have the capability of doing that when you look at the baseball talent that just comes from the city of memphis and the number of kids that have gone on to other places and played in the big leagues and had good collegiate careers and professional careers and then when you look at the university of memphis i happen to actually play with two alums um, one of them played with in high school, Cliff Polite, uh, who ended up pitching in the big leagues. We grew up together. Um, and the other one was a catcher named Ryan Lindemann, and we played uh, junior college baseball together. Uh, and so when you look at that and then the number of other guys um, that have come through here and been successful, then you know that this is a place that has a solid foundation, uh, which was built by many coaches, but specifically by Coach Rock. What he did here in his time here was establish something that – People know that this is a place that has a chance to be a quality institution when it comes to baseball and playing at that level. And we intend to take that foundation that he has started and be able to build upon that and continue to take the program to a new level. I'm very, very excited about the opportunities that are here for us. I've talked to our, our players. Um, I think they're excited about the opportunity that is here for us. And the one thing that everybody needs to understand you will understand, you will identify the players in our program by how they carry themselves. Not because they're wearing a baseball t-shirt, not because they're wearing a baseball hat, and not because you saw them on the field and they look familiar. You will understand and recognize them by how they carry themselves across campus, how they carry themselves in the community, and the things that we do to put ourselves in a position to not only be successful on the field, but it has to start with off the field. And if we put that emphasis with our kids, the importance of that, then success on the field is a byproduct of us doing all the right things. For all you people out there that are baseball people, you understand baseball is a sport that you can't skip steps and expect to be successful. There is a rhyme, there is a reason, there is a way that things have to be done. And even when you do all those things the right way, it doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome is gonna come out in your favor, but you establish a pattern of behavior that will lead to success long-term because you're consistent in how you go about your business. 
we will be consistent in how we go about our business. We will do it at a very high level. We will have a high attention to detail. We will to start put ourselves in a position where we define the difference between being beat and losing. Losing for us will not be an option. If a team plays better than us and they beat us, then so be it. But when you lose, you are giving something away and we're not going to give anything away. Not in the community, not in the classroom, and definitely not on the field. And once our kids and players understand that concept, then they will see that the idea of going out and being successful will take care of itself. And as a Division I coach and as a Division I program, the goal is Omaha, period, point blank. If we're not trying to get to Omaha, go someplace else, do something different. Because this is a place where that is going to be what we're going to be working for on a daily basis. And there aren't going to be any excuses of why we can't get there. I've been at places where we've had much, much less than what we have here. I've been at places where I got there and we didn't have tees. And we didn't have a cage to hit in. And we had to make adjustments. And I told my players then and I'll tell our players now. None of that matters because nobody wants to hear excuses. Either you get it done or you don't get it done. And that's all it comes down to at the end of the day. And our kids will understand that as we go through this process and this program is going to be about getting it done. We're gonna enjoy having you guys out. You're gonna enjoy watching us play. Any game that we step on the field and play, it is going to be a dog fight. If that team is lucky enough to walk out with a W, they won't wanna play us again because it was too tough. They're gonna to have to grind to get a win from us. And our kids are going to enjoy that process. You as fans are going to enjoy that process. And I'm looking forward to doing some great things here at the University of Memphis. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We'll now go ahead and uh, begin a Q&A session with members of the media. If you would, please raise your hand. Scott has a microphone that will pass around. Um, we'll start with uh, Frank, and then we'll go to Jeff. Karen, when you look at the fact that you are one of a uh, few black head coaches across the country, in this opportunity, what's the significance, not only for you, but for other black head coaches who are trying to push through that threshold? Well, the reality of it is, is the significance is for all the other coaches. I'm here. I've been granted this opportunity. And so now it's, it's on me to make sure that I do the things to create more opportunities for other coaches that come along. Uh, is huge um, because the other two coaches that you speak of is Edwin Thompson, who's at Georgetown, um, Elton Pollock, who is at Presbyterian, and Elton, um, Coach Pollock has been there for a while, Georgetown uh, with Edwin, he just got there recently. And so now I think that the difference between where they are and where we are is we're in a desirable location. Uh, we're in a power, in my opinion, power baseball conference uh, when you look at it on the landscape of, of the depth of our league. And so now the visibility, not only for other minority coaches, but the visibility for other minority players. Uh, when I was at Southern, there were players that, that wanted to come, but they felt that their opportunities weren't gonna be as great when it came to a professional standpoint and visibility by being in an HBCU. So now we're in a position where we can offer you some things and you now have that visibility because we're in a, we're in a power five conference or a power type conference, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to baseball. So I think that that idea is, is really good. Yeah, my next question is going to ask, what, what would be the impact or what is the impact being able to see more uh, African-American coaches in terms of, of having those players have those opportunities or feel like they can have those opportunities in the game of baseball? Well, I think the, the biggest thing with that is we're going to be that mecca, if you will, of developing young minority coaches and creating more opportunities for minority players at the youth level. When you're in a community uh, that is dominated um, that is a that is 65 percent black community, then the opportunity to grow the game in our community is going to start here at the University of Memphis. It's going to start on our baseball field. It's going to start with us doing camps and clinics and bringing those people in. And I think once people see the impact that we're going to have, it will then have a trickle down effect, if you will, of other people saying, well, if they can do that there, then what's the model that we need to put in place here in our communities, and we'll have outreach and we'll look to do those things and help those communities get those things accomplished as well. Coach Jeff Reinwald of the Tiger Sports Network. We've seen what, what, what Blair and, and Laird liked about you, and you touched on a little bit in your opening statements, but once you got into the interview process and really kind of got into the nuts and bolts, 
what specifically was it about Memphis that, that you knew this was the job that you really wanted to pursue? Like I said, I think once having a conversation with each one of them, understanding their vision, uh, understanding the passion that they had ab about the baseball program being successful, knowing where they want to take the program and what the success of Olympic sports does with that. And specifically with baseball, you, you know, when you look at the landscape of college sports, baseball is kind of one of those big three, right? It's it's football, men's and women's basketball, and in a lot of circles, it's baseball is that next one. And so for us to be able to come in here and play on a national level, then I think it just uplifts the vision of not only that they're trying to get accomplished, but up, uplifts the visibility of the university as well. So when you factor those things in, and then again, like I said, when you look at the community here in Memphis, uh, when you look at the baseball talent that is in this area, it is a baseball rich area and environment. And my goal is to make sure that the kids in the city of Memphis and surrounding areas stay here. Uh, the, the one thing is you talk to different people, those kids that are quality players, they want to stay if they have a reason to stay. Well, we're going to give them plenty of reason to stay. Um, and we're not going to be dissuaded by somebody, oh, he's only a Power 5 guy or he's only an SEC guy. I'm not afraid to be told no. Um, so if you can give me a reason why you should go someplace else other than come here, I'll listen and respect that. But I'm going to give you every opportunity and every reason why this is the place where you can come and you can make the place and you don't have to go to a place that makes you. Hello, Coach Greg Gaston, Sports 56 Radio and ESPN Plus. Welcome to Memphis. The biggest challenge in your mind to make this a top 50 program would be what? I think the biggest challenge is just putting us in a position where we change the perception of what Memphis baseball is currently. Um, I think that, you know, people can talk about facilities and you can talk about all these other things. Well, at the end of the day, from the pitcher's mound to home plate is 60 feet, six inches like anywhere else. From home plate to first base, it's 90 feet. We're going to have turf that's going to be some of the best turf, uh, um, in my opinion, in the country. We're going to have an environment. Uh, we're going to have a passionate fan base. And so I think once kids understand what it is that we're about and then the coaching staff that we'll put together, they're going to be teachers. They're going to be developers. So we'll be able to tell these kids we have the ability to teach and develop like anywhere else in the country. Why not Memphis? And so I think once we change that perception and everybody understands what we're about, I think that is, that's the biggest hurdle. Coach, uh, Dick Willotion, the word undervalued talent was used by Blair a couple of times. You came from MLB draft. Would you define what, ML, uh, what, what undervalued talent is? And when you're facing SEC competition for those athletes, can, can, is that the most important thing you have to have? So I, th I think you have to have um, quality kids that are that have a high baseball IQ and understanding of how to play the game. Um, at Missouri, that's what we, that's where we were successful is quote unquote that undervalued talent. Talent. Um, I'll give you an example. We recruited a young man from Columbus, Georgia. He had two teammates that were recruited by every school in the SEC. He had no Division One offers, zero. He had one junior college offer. It was a bad body. It was a left-handed swing, but there was a high baseball IQ and he had some ability. He came to a camp. We actually offered him his freshman year. He played every position on the field for us and only made four errors. And he was all freshman SEC. His junior year, he gets drafted in the 13th round. And two years later, he's in double A with 22 pumps. So it's being able to go out and find guys and really digging deeper and not worry about what the rankings say, not worry about what's on Twitter not any of those types of things. It's finding the guys that you believe fit your program and have that mentality. And the key is having a little chip on their shoulder. Uh, when, we, when we were making the transition to uh, the SEC, we played Memphis at Missouri. And you guys had a guy here, his name was Jacob Wilson. And he was a dude. I had a man crush on him, <laughs> period, point blank. And I told my head coach at the time, Coach Jamison, I said, that's why we'll be successful in the SEC. And he said, why? I said, because kids like that that are out there, that people can't, that get overlooked, those kids can play anywhere in the country. Well, the Jacob Wilsons of the world, we need to find those guys and get more of those guys here at Memphis. That guy was a dude. He could play anywhere with anybody, and those kids are out there, so it's going to be our job to go out and find those kids. Hey, Coach Jarvis, we're your action new slot in Memphis. No. You came from the SEC. You, you know that Memphis is surrounded by SEC programs that have these palaces that they play. Kids are interested in bricks and mortar. They like this feel about you can do this and you can do that. But what they see is what they see. 
since you've been inside an SEC program and, and know how they recruit that way, does your recruiting rates change that much uh, in saying that, well, we may not have this, or do you even go into that, or do you sell them on that future that they that will be here? So I think we talked to one of the things that we will we will place a high emphasis on our kids is we want them to be great. And we want them to be great versus being good. And the difference between the two is those that are great have an internal motivation that supersedes their need for external approval. So we want kids that you know what it is in here that drives you to be the best that you can possibly be. And you don't need to, again, you don't even know how many Twitter followers you have. You don't need to have an institution that qualifies you as a player where I have to go play here. If I don't play in the SEC or I don't play in the ACC or I don't play these places, then I'm not as good as some of these other guys. We want the guys that say, I'm a good player and I'm going to surround myself with other good players and I want to be in a good environment with good coaches. Because at the end of the day, regardless of the conference that you play in, it's about whether or not you play in the postseason. The team that won the national championship last year didn't make their conference tournament. They have all the things that they need to have. There's, there's teams every year that are in power conferences that don't end up in the postseason. So is the ultimate goal to go to a Power 5 conference and use that as a qualifier to say that, hey, I played in Power 5 X? Or is the ultimate goal to play in a place where you're going to grow and develop and mature as an individual as well as a baseball player and have a chance to win the championship? Hey, Coach, back here, Samari Terry, WRG News Channel 3. I know that you kind of talked about it earlier, just being just only one of three black coaches, but you're making history here. Has that really sunk in how impactful your hiring is here at the UNM? It hadn't until I got a call from uh, a man who's from Memphis, and he tracked my number down, um, and he called me, and he said, hey, I just had to call you because I heard the news, and when I heard the news, I had to pull over and shout. Um, that's, that's when it became real. Um, and so the fact that we're in 2022, still talking about first, and I am that first, it means a lot. And I plan to do everything in my power to make sure that we stop talking about first and that other people follow in our footsteps and see the things that we're going to do here and make some powerful things happen. <laughs> Coach, over uh, here in the back, Avery Braxton, ABC 24, obviously the second collect your thoughts there, but as I was listening to the administration talk about you, I heard a lot about your name being brought up, uh, and clearly it seems like your name was being brought up in rooms that you clearly were not in, and people are speaking of your character. What does it mean to have your name brought up that way, and for people to be able to talk about you in front of all these folks, in front of, you know, your boys? Yeah, you know, it's, that's what it's about, right? It's, it's, um, as a father, you want to put your sons in a position where you you have you hope that they understand what real life is about. You want them to be prepared uh, for that. Um, I'm constantly on them. I'm I'm very hard on them. Like I, I make no bones about it. Um, and and I do it from the standpoint of real world is going to be tough on you. Um, and and when we do the things that we do and we get to these positions, I'm also quick to tell them it's not about me. Right. It's it's there's other people that have helped me get to this place. I've had uh, former coaches that I work for. Coach Jamison is a coach that I work for who helped me get to this place. Mike Anderson is a coach who coached me in college who helped me get to this place. Uh, Brian Reese, who I played for, helped me get to this place. So I didn't do this all by myself. And and again, being able to make sure that that message is sent through to them so that they understand you go about your business a certain way because you never know who's watching and you never know what they're going to say about you after you leave. And so it's important to me that we emphasize those things, not only with my sons, but we emphasize those things with the kids in our program so that that's a lasting message and a lasting impression that they have. Yeah, hi, Jeff Hawkins from the Daily Memphian. I have three questions. First of all, which son came to the rescue there? Zion. Zion, good job. How old is He's 11. Uh, the second question is, um, 
What has it been like? I mean, you've made your world way through what has been unfortunately sort of a largely white sport, probably too much so, you know, increasingly. What has it been like for you as you've made your way, made your way through it? There's there's been moments of, of frustration, um, but um, I was raised by my grandparents. My my parents were juniors in high school when I was born. Um, and so my grandmother sold shoes in a department store. My grandfather was a minister and worked as a county assessor. Um, and and there was a very uh, blue collar mentality. There was a very um, again, there are no excuses because nobody wants to hear excuses. Um, and so for me, I was never in a situation where I felt like there wasn't anything that I wasn't going to be capable of doing uh, based on my determination. No was never an answer for me. Um, it, it was always, OK, well, you're telling me this, but there is a way. I just have to figure out what that way is. And so there was there was obstacles, but there weren't barriers. Um, they didn't keep me from doing anything. I just had to figure another way to work around those and, and get to the ultimate goal. Um, and so as I sit back uh, and I do look over my career and, and, and the things that I've been able to accomplish, um, it's it's twofold. You there is a sense of pride, um, but. Transparency, I said to Laird, Laird and Blair when we were sitting down, if I hadn't done all the things that I had done, we'd be sitting ha here having this conversation. And the reality is no. And so, again, that's still unfortunate um, that we have to do more than other people and have to have something bigger and brighter to make sure that we're, we're noticed as minority coaches. Um, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. Um, and so it doesn't do us any good to complain about it. It's just again, figure out a way to get it done. And I sit here in front of you today figuring out a way to have gotten it done. And then lastly, um, in terms of that anecdote you told about getting the call, it was a Memphis former player. I don't know if you wanted to say who it was, but where were you, what, what, who, what, who, who, what's the category of this person? Was it a former player? It was, it was, actually, it was actually a former athletic employee from, of another sport who's from Memphis. Yeah, great. Go ahead. Coach, I see you, you were in a jersey with number 45. Maybe it's just that's the jersey they had available, or is there any significance to that number? There is true significance to this number. Um, I'm a huge, huge Bob Gibson fan. Gibson fan. Um, I'm from St. Louis. Um, he, to me, Bob Gibson epitomizes determination, Depitomi epitomizes um, just every work ethic, um, dominance, uh, just when, when you, when, when you go back and you hear people talk about Bob Gibson and what it was to be on a field with him and what it was to stand in the batter's box against him, uh, there's this reverence and fear. Um, and I had a chance to meet him at one point. And so, yeah, I've, I've been a huge fan of his forever. Um, so, yes, that's why we're at number 45. Anything else today? Okay, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all for being here today. We have some refreshments in the back, so feel free to. Oh, yeah. oh yes, right there. Hello. Hello. Nope. <laughs> what will be the first of what will the University of Memphis host its first baseball camp and will it be for Memphis Little League? We we will we are going through the process of of uh, getting some camps together, um, and so we'll we'll get those out. We're having some field renovations this summer um, that that won't allow us to do it this summer, but but I promise you uh, there will be a connection with Memphis Little League and the University of Memphis baseball program, and we will have plenty of camps and clinics and opportunities um, as well as well as an open door policy for you guys to be able to come out and watch practice um, within the rules NCAA rules. Uh, because I want you to get that real feel. I want you to understand what we're about, and I want you to, to get an opportunity to see how, how this thing is played and hopefully uh, see yourself on our field someday. Okay, thank you again, everybody. And, yeah, help yourselves in refreshments in the back. <laughs>